I'm only going to get the second half of this, so I forgot to record it. <laughs> but uh, people that are unhappy can get their money back and show up. Um, yes, I think in general, um, it's just a question of your ingenuity. You can do th one kind of <coughs> exercise to do a lot of what the other ones can. All right. Let's see if this thing is going to work or what. All right, good. All right. So, which one of these prevents CSR? Quit at 30, I guess. All right, and that's a hidden field, is the CS anti-CSRF token. All right, unfortunately, same origin policy doesn't do it. That just means you can't get the response into the page, but you can still send the request, and the request is often enough to accomplish your goal. All right, which one requires a stored XSS vulnerability? Although after Tom's question, I'm not so sure, but anyway. So. <laughs> but they did say it required one. At least it's simpler to understand how to do it with what. And that's, of course, on-site request forgery. You get to put poison on the site, or someone views the site, and then you request to the same site. There's nothing cross-site about it. Um, well, there may be ways to do it without this, but anyway, the example he had here did it that way. All right. And... Uh, which method of authentication causes these vulnerabilities? All right, looks like I can quit. To, I'll wait till 30, I guess. All right, and it's of course the cookie because you have it automatically attached to every request. This is like a lot of people are nervous about um, login uh, password managers that automatically log in for you. My roommate refuses to automatically pay his bills online because you know that means it will happen even when you wish it didn't happen. But it's more convenient and that's always the issue. Anyway, so uh, this is a cute, probably a good term. This I heard this at clickjacking. It was all over DEF CON six or seven years ago. The general problem is you are redress. So here's another way to go. You don't find any way to inject code or anything. You trick the user into clicking on things and they don't understand what they're clicking on. I know the simplest one has been around forever is they pop up a box, do you want this, yes or no, and both of them are yes. Um, a lot of malware does that. But you can do a much more sophisticated one. You open the target page in an invisible iframe. Iframes have the ability to be transparent. So you open Amazon in front of the page and you put a, something behind it that they think they're clicking on, but they're really clicking on the invisible Amazon page. That's clickjacking. And so you've got the, your banking page open here. You're clicking to confirm something. You think you're clicking this page to win. Um, and that's the fundamental issue. And there were great examples, and this was new, of just showing people doing awful things, you know, format C, delete your account, you know. Um, so that's the general way it works. Uh, you can do more. There are, I remember some cute demos where you'd, you'd have to type in like a sentence to prove something, like a CAPTCHA, and it would take letters you typed. Like you type in a sentence, and it would take um, format C colon. It would pick the letters out. <laughs> um, you, can, you can write a script that will pick out the letters from whatever you're typing and put them in another frame where they're interpreted differently. Um, you can steal mouse movements. You can have a game where they have to click the block and drag it down here, and what they're really doing is highlighting their name and password and copying it into a form field and sending it off to you. Because, uh, you know, the, all these things are possible with JavaScript and other scripting languages to make, and since you can have an invisible page and the other page, you can influence them both at the same time. Uh, so there, when this became really well known, 
um, the, everybody tried putting up defenses, and um, Stanford took the top 500 pages and found their defenses, and all their defenses were frame busted. And the idea was, you add script to your page so it will notice when it's in an iframe and it'll bust out of the iframe and reload in the top instead. So this will stop you from putting things in an iframe that don't belong there. And they found that all 500 websites were vulnerable. This defense was easily defeated. So here's an example. Here's frame busting code. If the top location of the page I'm in is not equal to self location, then set top location to self location. So if I'm in a frame, then bust out of the frame. This is the simplest way to do it. When that script runs, your page will jump to the top, or so you think. The problem is um, there's a bunch of attacks. One simple thing to do is just redefine location to be a variable. That will override the default variable of top location with another location. Now when you try to use it as something to open, it will cause an exception and that script will not run, and you'll stay in the frame. Another thing you can do is hit, hook this thing called Windows on before load event, and that means that's a way to have an event handler that will run before the event, notice there. So when it tries to do that, it runs your code first, and your code can um, you know, block it by doing whatever you want. One simple thing to do is redirect it to your server that will give you a 204 no content response, because if you have a redirect, redirect, and no content, the browser will just undo all those things and say, nope, forget the whole thing. That's another way to stop it. Another way to stop it, you can def when you open the iframe, you can put the sandbox parameter in the iframe. And if you do that, the iframe will open and it still uses cookies, but scripting won't run. So their frame busting script won't run, but you can probably still do your attack as long as your attack goal didn't require scripting on the page down there. Um, you can use, this one I thought was really cute. You remember how these cross-site scripting filters work? If I send a request, like if I go up here to my URL and I put something up here like um, ID equals script uh, alert one script. This is a typical cross-site scripting thing that you'll do. And if you do this, um, what will happen with most modern browsers is when I send this request, and then a page comes back and it notices that this stuff is on the page and it matches what was in the URL, it will block the page and say the XSS auditor has saved you from this evil attack. So what you do is you take stuff in their script, their frame busting script, and you just put it here where it won't do anything, but the browser will think you just had an attempt to do cross-site scripting because something script will come back in the page that it recognizes it came from the URL. I thought this is very clever. Um, this will trick the defense into thinking you're evil when you aren't. Um, and that will uh, just, that's a cute idea. And it shows the problem with almost all security solutions like a web application firewall, it, it doesn't know the context. It's just looking at one request and one response and if they look connected, it's, oh, this is evil. It doesn't know the big picture. That's why, if you remember the earlier uh, chapters we were talking about, they say you really have to build defenses considering the logic of your app and a generic defense in front of it is never going to be as good because it doesn't really understand the actual purpose these parameters are going by. It just tries to recognize them on a list of known bad e values. Anyway, <clears throat> so the right way to prevent this, instead of trying to add more scripts, which is just weak, is a special header. The X frame option header added just for this purpose. You can put a header in your response from the HTTP request on the server that says, here's the page, but don't load this page in a frame. This page does not belong in a frame. It tells the browser, never put this page in an iframe. Or you can say, put it same origin, which means only I can put it in a frame. Nobody else can put it in a frame, whatever you like. That's the point. Um, now, another thing that happens a lot is people write mobile versions of the website. Now, these days, it's all about apps, but a lot of people use browsers on their websites because they're not willing to install 100 apps like me. And so if you use your browser on your website, your mobile version of your page detects that and sends them a different page. And a lot of people don't bother with anti-click jacking on the mobile version because on the mobile version, you're not really doing much typing and dragging around anyway. So there's really, really much less likely that someone would succeed in doing one of these attacks there. But the problem is the mobile version will run on a desktop machine too, so I can open the mobile version of your website in an iframe on a desktop. And now when someone is clicking on the game behind it, they're doing all this stuff. So just because you can't do the attack practically on that device doesn't mean you don't need the defense on that version of your website. 
And so this is the same old kind of logic flaw where you, you think it's okay to be sloppy because you think there's some other control, but you have to examine that assumption. Can you really trust that other control to always apply? Um, all right, so if you want to capture data across domain, if I want to like steal a cookie and move it to another website, the same origin policy is intended to prevent this. Um, but there are ways around it. Um, you can do it by injecting HTML. So suppose I have a website and it's got a form and I'm able to inject some HTML above it. And they may have even done some filtering to try to limit what I'm allowed to inject up there so they won't let me put in a script tag or anything. But I can put some stuff there. There are things I can put before the form tag that will cause it to send the data to the wrong place, which are pretty cute. The simplest one is the simple injection here, which is the thing you've done many times. You put in an image tag without a closing apostrophe, and now it will add all the page up to the next apostrophe into the name of the, into this um, parameter called HTML equals. Now a whole bunch of the page that used to be a form is now perceived as just a parameter, and it's sent up to my server. So I get a block of code, and if I'm lucky, that will include like the anti-cross site scripting notch here, that random number. Got to be the page loaded with this hidden field, and I now got a bunch of source code, which will include the hidden field. So I managed to steal data that was private to one domain to another domain with this attack. Yeah. Just Burp modifying the little bit of HTML. Yes, that's one. Burp certainly is one example, but you know, most cases you don't have as much control as you have through Burp. Okay. So you really only have like one parameter that's used somewhere. Like we had before, you might have a parameter that's used in the name of an image tag. It lets you put in a little bit of stuff. And, but here's another one that I thought is really cute, and I didn't know this. You just put in a second form tag before the first one. Now, I didn't know this, but if you have two form tags, and then down here you have parameters and submit button, the browser will just take the first one and silently ignore the second one. So the form that is intended to send it up to their server, well, now just send it to my server. What could be more awesome? <laughs> When they click the submit button, it'll go to the wrong server. Bloody awesome. Anyway, so uh, um, there's a, well, you, the, the assumption is that you have some ability to inject up here, which would mean typically that there's some parameter you control that's used up there. Like you control a file name for an image tag, or you can control the search term, which is then repeated up there. Typical sort of thing. You, that's, that's the premise. You have some control over something that goes up there. Would you set up yeah. uh, that listening server? Oh, listening server. The simplest thing is just turn on forensic logging, and then it logs all the URLs that come in with all the parameters. That's the easiest thing. The only thing to do would be you know, TCP dump or Wireshark, sniff the packets. Um, all right. So uh, that's a cute one. So here's another one. Now, this I, it took me a while to understand this, and then I realized how beautiful it is. So we all do this, especially in the modern platforms. You load these big JavaScript libraries. I see all the modern websites have it. They have some big library they load from somewhere else. Like if you have a Google CAPTCHA, you have to load a bunch of JavaScript from Google servers that goes on your page. So it is now common that your page is yourdomain.com and you're loading scripts from somebody else. Well, that would be fine in a simple world because they wouldn't put anything sensitive in those scripts like passwords or anything. But the problem is then the world got more and more complicated. And now we have Ajax where people are loading just a little, not a whole page, but just a little data. Like I have a Google map and I drag it up. I want just the bottom one inch here. Send me just that, but not the whole page. I want just one fact. Send me just the phone number, just the username, just, just that. Okay, so you're sending all these little requests and little responses coming back. And um, so now, consider this example. The user logs into some website. Then he clicks Show My Profile. Now, the way to show my profile is actually implemented is it um, has a local script called Show User Info that if I had the information, it would draw it in a little box or pop up or something. And then the page loads this script, your JSON script. It loads some script from their server, which, and the script, when, it, when I click the link to Show Info, it, it, do, it downloads this script and runs the script, and the script, um, calls show user info with all this data. The script fetches the data from the database and then it calls the local show user info, which is local to the page because I have all these different page versions, right? The mobile version was. That's, that's a way you might reasonably design a page. And if you do, you're screwed. Because I go to my server and I make a page that loads your script and I make a different show user info function. So the point here is you have a script here which can harvest data from your server and then, it's and then this script calls the show user info function, which is not included here. 
it's included here. So I can make a show user info function just puts it up on the screen. And now, um, if a logged in viewer opens this page, their user info will pop up into something under my control. And this is the typical demo where you put it in an alert box. In the real world, I would send it to my server where you don't know what has happened and I got all your stuff. So I thought this is pretty cool. It's not that the, the secrets are in there, but I was able to import functionality with that script, which then handled it in a way that moved it to something that was under my control. And I can see how it's very difficult, especially in a big design team, for people to think of this sort of thing. Like, I write the script, the script could come down, then I pass it to something else, and I don't really know who's gonna write that. Some other team will write that thing, and then are they really gonna be something an attacker could control or not? That's hard to see, you know. Anyway. Right. It happens all the time, like people are using JavaScript that's written by somebody else and just implement something. Like node.js and all the others. Yeah, and there are like so yeah. many of them right now. And they learn how to use it, and nobody really knows or cares how they work or anything. And they make various assumptions. And sometimes it's just like, a, you know, somebody wrote something and everybody started using it. Yeah, yeah. And then that script got compromised because nobody would ever think that it might happen. And then, like, everybody who was using it got compromised too. Yes, yeah, exactly. But yeah. it's usually like the cheap stuff for free. <laughs> well, hopefully. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so, so if you want to prevent this stuff, you can use anti CSR tokens. Um, that would help. Um, then another cute trick is to, when you make a library, poison it. The library will start with a function like this for semicolon, semicolon, semicolon. This is an endless loop. So the library will download and freeze your browser. And the point is, you don't have to load your library with a script source tag. You can load your browser with an XML HTTP request, and then you can trim the response. That gives you more control. So I can load it and then discard the first 50 bytes. And attackers that don't know that, that try to make an imitation page using my library, will find that for some reason my library just freezes their browser and doesn't work. Now this, I'd say, is kind of a weak defense because they could just look at the library and figure out what's going on. But you know, it'll slow down people. It'll slow down automated attacks. It's, it's, it's a defense of a sort. Um, this library must be loaded with XML HTTP requests and then information that they won't have immediately to trim out part of it. Um, another thing is to only allow the code to be loaded via POST requests. H XML HTTP request can make a POST request, but if you just put script source, that's not a POST request. So people will find that they cannot include my library on their page by doing the simple obvious thing. Again, I think it's pretty weak because they can just look at my source code and figure out how I loaded it, but still, it'll slow people down. Um, then there's Flash. You know, Flash made so many problems. And one thing about Flash is you have your game and you want to load a component from somewhere else, so they wanted to make it possible to load content from many domains. For example, Adobe, who made Flash. They've got a problem that a big company might very well have. They keep buying other companies. Mm -hmm. And now you've got all their stuff and you want included in your stuff, and you don't really want to like rename all the servers and rewrite all the code. So they, they have this thing called a flash policy file called crossdomain.xml. You know, in the root of your website, you need to have um, robots.txt to tell search engines where not to go, and you have um, favicon.ico to make a little image that shows up in the browser favorites. And you can also have this thing, crossdomain.xml, and if you have it, you can tell it what other domains will I let flash reach. And so Adobe will let any, anything in Photoshop, Acrobat, Adobe, or Macromedia mix, because we're all one company now, and that makes sense, but don't trust anybody else. So that's what this policy file does. The problem is, most people don't know about this, don't think about it, and they don't put up a crossdomain.xml. Now, in a sane world, if you didn't have this file, no crossdomain would be allowed, but that's not what happens. If you don't have a crossdomain.xml, then um, a page can specify where it will load it from. And I can then load a malicious one, and I can just allow it from everywhere. <laughs> So if you didn't remember to put up that file, I can just, uh, my flash can just reach all over the place. And so by the way, the policy file itself, just like the robots.txt might disclose confidential things like maybe I don't want the whole world to know that I own Photoshop and Adacrobat, and now I've made it pretty clear that I do. And even worse, you know, there might be like private top secret scripts listed here, trust the private top secret scripts and they think nobody will know. So, you know. Yeah. From my experience, even with like there was all those plugins, they would usually say like you have to, you know, hide this, this, and these pages. Yeah. Nobody ever does it. Like right, you just type it in in the URL and it would be just yeah. there. Yeah, because they don't tell you how to hide it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They yeah. 
they just like you have to be, you know, have to have that knowledge as an administrator, I guess. Yeah. But well, if I just assume that. When I've wondered about this, one of the things that I should have in my project, I have these my SQL, SQL injections and how to block it. Another thing a student told me I really should do, and I really should add it to, like, to this class, my others, is how to properly put up the login details for your SQL web page. Because I find out I, what you do is you put a file called credentials in another directory that is not the web directory. So even if people can upload PHP cells and everything, they can't get it, and you include that file. And only your scripts on your server can include that file. Other people can't. But anyway, that's, um, many people don't know that, and so their scripts contain raw credentials for, to connect to SQL servers. Anyway, um, so like you can make a custom policy file, and then that can have whatever you want in it. And then there's Java. Java, of course, does a lot of foolish things. This one is kind of a new level of hell. I don't know why this happened, but Java, if you have multiple websites at the same IP address, it will treat them all as the same website and let them share, which is really bad these days of shared hosting. Where you have know, hundreds of websites on the same IP address. Yeah? No mind. Okay. Really anyway, and Java has no provision for a policy file. You can't do anything about it. It just has its interpretation and you're stuck with it. Although I think Java and Flash are both pretty much on the way out. Yeah. The deal with shared hosting, like, if you, you know, one domain compromise spread all over, and other yeah. people just couldn't, like, oh, why did you block that IP? All of the domains are compromised, and they don't get it, like, up. Oh. That's right. It's but, so obvious. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, but Microsoft actually, in IIS 7.5, they actually made it so that if you host many <coughs> websites with the same server, they have separate identities. With the hopes being that if one of them is compromised, it doesn't immediately take over all the others as the, the way it used to. But, of course, <laughs> there, you're still got a uh, increased chance of that happening. And so we're all moving to HTML5. So HTML5, there's this thing called XML HTTP request, which you can use to do crafted HTTP requests that's very versatile. And one thing you might want to do is harvest data from another domain. So it is allowed. You can do it, but the domains have to give you permissions in the HTTP header. So when you try to, you're in one domain and you try to fetch data from another domain, it will add origin to it. Like, which is hopefully more reliable than refer. Um, so the origin will tell me where I came from. And uh, then the server response will include parameters in the header that tell it what you're allowed to do. So access control, allow origin, this will let you go anywhere. You can put in a bunch of these. And there are different conditions under which it will do different things. Here's some examples. You can restrict the method. You can do some whatever ping other is. There's a lot of things you can do. Allow this, allow this method, allow this header maximum age, there are various parameters you can add to the request. And of course, if you were serving these requests over HTTP, anybody in the middle could just alter them, so you ought to be using HTTPS. And then you'd really be in pretty good shape. I mean, then these, these headers can't easily be modified or removed, and they tell the browser what to do. So as long as your browser obeys commands, you should be in pretty good shape. Um, all right, I got a few eye clickers about that stuff, and it's right on time. All right, so. What's the weak defense against click chat? <coughs> you can see why English majors hate us, because we make up all these words all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a word, that is not a word. <laughs> And Microsoft now likes to ram three words together and call it a word. Anyway, um, so frame busting is the weak defense where you try to run some kind of script to bust out of the frame, but of course it's not too hard to thwart that, so it's not a very good defense. All right, which one's a way to exploit an HTML injection vulnerability? And that is the second form tag, is one of the attacks there. This is one of the many, many problems caused by the fact that browsers don't complain about bad code. They just do some, they just sort of fix it and continue to display the page, which is terrible. If it would just complain syntax error on line seven like C, you wouldn't have vulnerabilities, but everybody would hit your guts because their browser wouldn't work. <laughs> so it's the way it always is. 
convenience over is more important than security. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. What's the recommended way to stop clickjacking? Hopefully better than the other one. <laughs> and this actually became well known maybe five or six years ago, so I think the defense is actually pretty good. I think there's been enough time that if there was a way past this, people would have found it. I don't know, with all the CarPlay and other stuff coming out years, years Yeah, later. yeah. <laughs> there, there are always new things to find, but the things, people were really shooting at this fix, you know, so I think it's pretty good. Anyway, that's extreme options is the better way to do it. Like nobody ever broke through parameterized queries, so it's occasionally they actually fix something and it's a good fix. <laughs> it mostly is the things nobody ever thought of is where you find the ridiculously simple ones like Heartbleed. Somebody added that goofy parameter, nobody used it, that's when you're going to get it. <laughs> All right, which one is the header field used in XML HTTP requests? That is uh, origin, using the request. By the way, it's, uh, I'm going to interrupt this for an ultra important announcement that I forgot to tell you. Um, yeah, the Department of Defense has a vulnerability disclosure policy that just came out. You can now hack defense.gov. It's fine, the, it's now legal, you can do it. What you do, you do have to, here's your rules. You can test it, you can, uh, tell them about it. You have to not exploit anything any more than you have to to prove it's vulnerable. You cannot exfiltrate confidential data. You have to tell them and shut up about it and give them time to fix it, of course. But this is not unreasonable. you got stuff to do here. So, you know, so I immediately went there and it's complete crap. Boy, it's asking for it. It's all based on Windows. It's got all kinds of error messages that are overly informative. It is really crappy looking, so I bet there's a ton of things to find. The reason they did this is because the previous one that was very limited, they found like 150 major flaws and fixed them. And that was just like their entertainment website. That was like, this is now the real thing. Anything in defense.gov is now wide open, so give it a shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is this just their one website, or does this include all of the use military? And anything in the defense.gov domain, which is yeah. not everything. They have links to go off to Navy and military trucks and stuff, and those not yet. But if this succeeds, and it looks like it will, they will probably expand it further. And this is a good thing to tell other companies, like, you know, when I went to Code Camp, I said, look, you guys need one of these. And said, oh, no, we can't do that. So we'll attract a bunch of hackers. And I said, yeah, that's kind of the point. But, you know, after the Department of Defense does it, I think a lot of companies will begin to realize this is a good thing. You know, the bad guys are not waiting for you to invite them. <laughs> Inviting the good guys does not really cause a disaster, but they're terrified of it. Yeah. Uh, no, as far as, that's what I, I could tell from poking around, it doesn't even have any logins anywhere. I found like a password reset page that seems not to be active anymore. Uh, it seems to me like they've moved all that to some other servers. That's why they probably think it's okay. But still, it's, it's all using this .NET new content framework, which is mm -hmm. pretty crappy. It's all based on Windows. It's, Sorry. it's, you can tell it's patchwork. So these are inconsistent. And if you do it, is it like something that is, looks good on a resume? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you find a vulnerability at defense.gov, that would be on my resume right there. That'd be awesome. Um, of course, you have to wait until they tell you it's okay to tell the world about it. But, but as far as I can tell, they even did that with the last one. You know, after they passed it, you could then brag about it. One guy that I think was given a talk here, he was the guy that was number one. He found the most vulnerabilities on defense.gov. So that's well, awesome. On the top 10, that was Michael Powell, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's awesome. So, so oh, is this like published? Like who found um, vulnerabilities? I don't know. It might be. They ought to have like a Hall of Fame on there, and maybe they do. If not, it probably will. It's through Hacker One. They have yes, through Hacker One. And Hacker One has a list of how many people found, how much money they made, and everything. Yeah. So, I mean, anyway, check it out. It's good, clean fun. Anyway, so let's go back to this. I just realized that's ultra important thing I forgot to tell you. And of course, you get extra credit. <laughs> but I, I think that would be the least of your concerns at that point. Anyway, so. Um, Let's see if I can figure out how to make this stinking thing work. Okay, that one and this one. There we are. So, which one of these controls flash security?
All right, and that's that crossdomain.xml file, which you really ought to put there. And uh, all right, and which one is clickjacking? The more dignified professional term for it. They call it UI redress, which is pretty cute. You alter the UI so that people misunderstand what they're doing. All right. So let me just uh, see who won. I'll stop the recording such as it is. Chapter 13A, only got part of it, such as life. <coughs>